Shares for beginners. Being short-sighted, it's very hard to avoid. It's very hard to avoid in other parts of life, but investing to create wealth is absolutely uh, devastating. We've quoted earlier a couple of studies, but all your listeners out there, I know myself, when I initially started investing myself directly, I was myopic, maybe being younger and being a bit more bravo. It's definitely something you want to avoid. So myopia, next time you think about doing something, head over to Specsavers. G'day and welcome back to Shares for Beginners. I'm Phil Muscatello. How many of our investing mistakes come from emotions and psychological biases? Warren Buffett said that the biggest obstacles to investment returns are fees and emotions. My guest today is here to rifle through the dark passages of the soul and hopefully show us how to become better investors. Hello, Zaffa. Hi, Phil. Great to be here. Great to have you. I'm looking forward to going through all the psychological undergrowth today. Looking forward to it. Zafa Subida has over 15 years of experience in the financial services industry and academia. He's currently with eInvest, where he works with advisors and researchers. In his spare time, Zafa enjoys furthering his knowledge of behavioural finance, which was your PhD subject area. That's right, a uh, very long time ago, but uh, in a subject area that I thoroughly enjoyed and I can continually enjoy to this day. And uh, I think I'm very fortunate to observe a lot of behaviours that... Uh, in real time. Yeah, that literally came out of <laughs> yeah. the, uh, the lab, so to speak. <laughs> and uh, they're happening on a daily basis. So is it like that? Is it something that you work on theoretically and you're actually seeing things playing out now that, as you say, were investigated in the lab? Yeah, well, most definitely. If I take a step back, uh, so when I was at uni and beginning the PhD a very long time ago now, shows my age, but um, a lot of the studies initially started with university students by psychology professors. So they were natural experiments. They were the guinea pigs. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, they were the guinea pigs, but uh, effectively these uh, professors, predominantly in the the US, they examine how people made decisions under uncertainty, which is what we do when we're investing. We're investing where there's uncertain uh, outcomes. And they eventually found that uh, people weren't behaving in line with what traditional economic models were built on. So that created this whole field of behavioral finance that examined in particular how people made decisions, whereas traditional theory, which a lot of the financial and economic models are built on, they're very prescriptive, you know, how people should be valuing assets, how people should make decisions based on this information set. So it was a really revolutionary field and uh, the field has you know, spawned into marketing, it's spawned into government policy and uh, a lot of your listeners no doubt uh, probably read a lot themselves and are probably uh, doing some nasty things but um, hey, we're all investors and that's the beauty of behavioural finance that It applies to everyone, professionals and individuals. They're kind of emotions. We're all emotional creatures, aren't we? Yeah, no, we're definitely uh, emotional creatures, but it's really how we make decisions and how we can better ourselves, which is an outcome of these emotions. These emotions trigger us, particularly in uncertain environments, probably to do things that that aren't good for us from an investment standpoint. So what's the the definition of behavioural finance? What's the laboratory definition of behavioural finance? Well, in short, the simple definition is it's a application of psychology to investment decision making. So very, very short. And that's really the short line uh, definition. So investing over the last two years has been extremely difficult. We've all been inundated with negative news, case numbers, worst case scenarios for outbreaks, lockdowns and now war. How does this affect our ability to make optimal investment decisions? That's a great question, Phil. And what really makes investment decision making difficult in these types of environment is the volume of information and what type of information that comes to mind. So yes, you've got a lot of economic commentators, you've got a lot of reports if you're an investment decision maker to consider, you've got a lot of economic data, but amongst all that, you've obviously got the usual headlines, the usual fake news, clickbait type of headlines that grab a lot of attention and that clouds our ability to make a decision. And when you're in this type of environment, instead of sitting back and making an investment decision over, you know, medium or longer term horizon, we tend to use shortcuts. And uh, it's these shortcuts that really cloud our decision making and 
you know, a lot of people may suffer with their wealth by making a, a decision that's not uh, in their best interest. So it's really that clouding around the volume of information and how we use it. That was interesting reading your article, actually, because um, I've only just recently learned the word heuristic, what heuristic means. And it's really, it's a shortcut, isn't it? A shortcut in thinking. That's right. They're just simple rules of thumbs to make um, decisions. And I guess an example of non-investment making heuristics is the old chocolate example. So think about if you've got uh, chocolate that's right next to you on the desk, you'll grab it. Now, if it's in the kitchen, are you going to walk over there and get it? You're probably not as likely to do that. Now, you're thinking, well, how does this make any sense to investments? Well, it does. If you monitor your investments frequently, you're more likely to make a decision. And whether that decision is good or bad, most times it's usually bad. That shows us that constantly looking at something isn't good. So in real life, we know if you look at something, if you're trying to lose weight, you weigh yourself every day, you'll get frustrated, go off track early. It's the same thing with investment decision making. If you keep looking at something frequently, you will more likely make a poor decision. So these are sort of common things that um, happen in real life in other domains that can also happen in the investment world as well. Mm. There's an article that we'll link to that listeners can read where you talk about the decisions that Australians were making in their superannuation funds during the COVID pandemic and how many negative impacts occurred with their investments by the decisions that they made due to fear. Tell us about that. Yeah, there was a good study, Phil, I think, especially given what time period they looked at, which was during the first initial bout of COVID in uh, early 2020. But really the main two studies that they found, which um, may be relevant to our topic, was that um, they found that the superannuation members, they switched between investment options. But what was important was with this switch, over 70% of people in this study had a negative outcome. Mm. So if we remember the market tanked and then there was a recovery. So they switched as the market tanked and kept tanking. And then obviously there was that recovery. By taking that course of action, by monitoring their investments very frequently, they did something that which was quite um, adverse to them. So is this in um, your superannuation options, you get like conservative or aggressive and various ranges along that spectrum. Are these people moving from aggressive to conservative? Is that the kind of actions that they were taking? Yeah, so they could have moved from those type of options where there could be diversified funds or they may have gone from equities back into cash, change their investment options like that. So that was along those lines there where they looked at transaction data. And that's what people do is as soon as that there's any fear, they start selling and trying to get into some form of safety. But this is not necessarily going to be great for their investment decisions in the long term, is it? No, exactly. And there was earlier studies back in the US, I think uh, just before the tech wreck, the late 90s. So if we all remember back many years ago when retail broking started, so when retail investors could go online and buy and sell quite easily, they found in the US late 90s that there was a study by an academic there and he found that um, the retail investors tended to sell their better performing stocks in their portfolio and they would hold on to their losers. And they found over a 12-month period, the ones they sold early went on average to return another sort of 3 to 4%. Yeah. And, you know, again, that's this whole basis of let's look at this, we've made a profit, let's trade early, get that gain, but then hang on. When the opposite happens, we'll hold it. So this whole, again, this whole use of information, looking at something too frequently, particularly if you're trying to create some medium to long-term wealth, which is very hard to be immune from, particularly as a a retail or self-directed investor. I think there's also another study that shows that the best performing portfolios at that time were people who'd actually passed away. No one was doing anything with these portfolios and they were actually performing better than most other more active portfolios. Yeah, that's right. There's, again, yeah, numerous studies that have shown some buy and hold or strategies with less turnover tend to do uh, better over time. And mm. probably, again, if you think about it, you like an investment, uh, if it's an equity investment, you do need time for that thesis to hold. And um, yeah, those portfolios definitely that have lower turnover will show those factors. Okay, so let's go through the list of self-sabotaging behaviours. And um, there's a couple of biases that you refer to, and one is representativeness. Tell us about representativeness. 
Yeah, no, and, and these um, self-sabotaging behaviours, they are heuristics. So mm-hmm. essentially these are also heuristics which we discussed earlier. Shortcuts, heuristic shortcuts, yeah. That's right. So representativeness is the tendency for investors to make decisions based on stereotypes where perhaps none exist. So it really is looking at information and making decisions, assuming that what's happened in the past, whether this trend, whether it's a short-term trend, persists for a longer period of time. And what we do find over time is that using this type of heuristic, there's actually no trend and um, they are basically chances or random chances of uh, fact that lead to poor decisions. So if I give you an example, let's look at earnings of a recently listed uh, company. So if you think about IPOs or companies with limited public history, they might show histories of high earnings growth or if it's an IPO, they might have forecasts for definitely high earnings growth. Now, as an investor, if we think this trend will continue, even though there might only be a couple of quarters of publicly available information, then um, we could be hit for a rude surprise when, in fact, the company's earnings don't grow to anywhere near that level because we would have gone in and paid a high value for that particular stock and the earnings don't eventuate and we get hit. That's probably a common one that's um, out there as well. And another bias is the availability bias. Tell us about that one. Yeah, now this is a uh, very interesting one. And again, these are all based on how we make decisions based on information that we have. But essentially the availability bias occurs when we make a decision based on recent experience or information that is readily available to you. And that's the key, what's readily available to you. So, um, you know, if you consider you watch the the news, six o'clock news or whatever time you watch the news, if a particular stock or particular market gets quoted in the news, then that's what you will base your decision on. So, yep, the ASX was down today. Therefore, I'm not going to invest tomorrow or the ASX has been down all week. I'm not going to invest now because I'm worried about the outlook. So where you get your information from and how frequently you source that information from does affect your decision. Conversely, other studies have found if we use availability bias, particularly at a high level, such as looking at market data, as I just gave an example of, we tend to overreact more because we think and we uh, overestimate that these bad events will continually occur and either you know we don't invest or we make a decision of like, let's cut out and get out of here. So, mm-hmm. so it's a very crucial bias that we need to keep an eye on of where we source our information from and how we use that information to make a decision. In preparing this interview, I recently interviewed a psychologist about the emotions that sabotage good investment decisions. And this was his list, greed, fear, euphoria, despair, overconfidence, and strangely enough, regret. Do you have any comments on that list? Yeah, look, I think that's a great list. And if you read the literature, not just the academic one, but a lot of the investing literature that's out there, these uh, emotions that um, the psychologist mentioned, they hit all the relevant um, characteristics. But the only one I would probably add to that list is really myopia. And that's that being short-sightedness. That's really detrimental to wealth creation. Again, if you are so short-sighted and you try and identify patterns based on information that's readily available, and particularly if it's not thorough or accurate information, then um, this is the most critical behavior that you would have to your long-term wealth creation, being short-sighted It's very hard to avoid. It's very hard to avoid in other parts of life, but investing to create wealth is absolutely uh, devastating. Like we've quoted earlier a couple of studies, but um, all your listeners out there, I know myself, I, when I initially started investing myself directly, I was myopic, maybe being younger and being a bit more bravo. It's definitely something you want to avoid. So myopia, just next time you think about doing something, head over to Specsavers. (laughs) <laughs> we are pattern recognition creatures, aren't we? I mean, we're actually built to recognise patterns, but sometimes we can just make up patterns out of thin air almost, can't we? Well, we look for patterns where none exist. None might exist, and, yeah. And that's the crucial piece there, that uh, when you look for these patterns, do they happen over time? And 
when these patterns occurred, what are the drivers of these patterns? Mm. So if you're looking at a, a company's price chart, well, what's been driving this uh, price movement, either up or down? What's happening on the fundamentals? What's happening to that investment relative to its peers? You need to consider more than that, just one piece of information. You need to look at the information in totality. Another thing that I've been really interested in thinking about lately is about the idea of shame. I mean, it's not just regret. You can make an investment decision, it goes bad, and you feel shame. You feel like a loser. And that's a really powerful emotion. Is that something that you've seen or have academics studied that? Yeah, so there's a couple of ways you can look at shame. And from the behavioural finance literature, the item I think that really summarises shame is loss aversion. So loss aversion. Loss aversion is probably something that really relates to shame. And the piece that loss aversion really summarises is that it describes the pain of losing on an investment. And what the psychologists and what the behavioural finance academics have found is that the pain of losing is two and a half times more than an equivalent gain. How do they measure that? <laughs> I mean, I've heard that statistic. How do they measure that? Oh, they've measured that through uh, a number of studies around uncertainty. Questionnaires, and, yeah. Yeah, well, experiments, they've been the predominant uh, way of uh, doing that. And this two and a half times, it's not just with university students, it's with individual investors. Mm -hmm. I think I did a study a long time ago with finance professionals. This was just after the GFC, and I think they viewed the loss about 40 times more than an equivalent gain. (laughs) So if you think about it, they had professional skin in the game, didn't <laughs> That's they? That's <laughs> right. And I think the way to interpret it is like, if I've gained 10%, I feel good. But if I lose 10%, I feel very, very bad. That's the sort of qualitative summary of it. Mm. But I think the other point around loss aversion and shame, there's a couple of points. The reason why we hold on to our investments So go back to that loss aversion, you've lost 5%, 10%, but it feels two and a half times more than that actual loss. The piece is we now feel that, hang on, I like this investment, I've liked it for a number of reasons, but I think it's going to rebound. So this is where we are letting the uh, losers ride, because we are in the hope that this investment will rebound. The second point is um, it's also that attachment. You've done so much work on this investment. You spent a lot of hours sourcing information, making the decision. And probably thirdly, you've gone out and told other people. So you've got that shame of, hang on, I'm going to end up here with egg on my face because, you know, I spent so much time looking at this investment and now it's underwater by 10, 15%. I need to hold on to it because it's going to come good. So this is a challenge. So this shame or this loss aversion, that is... It is something that uh, explains why we ride losers in the hope of our investments to recover. But if we go back to those (laughs) earlier studies, uh, we tend to do the opposite and uh, cap out our winners and um, ride those losers. Mm. And also, the other thing I should say is someone will say, what about tax and those sort of things? Well, yes, it could be some uh, tax uh, advantages there with uh, riding some of the losers. But, um, you know, that's an area where I recommend you talk to your tax agent on. (laughs) That's right. It's not about tax. It's about making money in the end, isn't it? Well, that's the old saying, isn't it? If you're paying tax, you're making money. What about searching for gurus? I think there's a lot of people who want a guru as well. Yeah. And um, this is, there was a very, very peculiar study. It was actually done by some New Zealand academics probably mid-2000s, and um, they call this the socialization effect. So if you think about it, you're going into a new environment, think about you're going into a a new workplace or you're going into a a new school if you're a child or you're going into some sort of uh, professional environment. When you walk into that environment, you, from a previous experience, what your average was, your average, you know, are these people really good to work with? Yeah, they're pretty good. They're average compared to what I've experienced in the past. So all of a sudden, if you were at a previous uh, workplace and your average might have been seven for your previous employees in in terms of how to work with and all that sort of um, jazz, now you go to a new workplace and all of a sudden it's a new environment and that average might be six or might be five or whatever it is. It's, It's declining or it could go the other way. So by going into a new environment, you start to change your mean. Now, what does that mean for investing? 
back to your point about gurus, you will start sourcing people at the barbecue. You will start following other investment commentators that are out there and that now frames your environment to make a uh, decision. So if they're a good stock picker or they're an average stock picker, do you measure that? And if they're not a good stock picker, if you haven't objectively measured that, guess what? Your new average is uh, going to be a lot lower than perhaps what it was before. So it's very, very crucial what environment you're in and where you source information from to help you with, again, your long-term wealth. And it's also worth knowing that gurus are fallible as well. They maybe don't even have any better idea of investing than you do. Well, that's right. And we've seen now the 10 second uh, investment updates you get on TikTok. Mm -hmm. So uh, the world is getting a lot more complex than what it was probably just two years ago. Yeah, I know. I wouldn't have made any money without those. (laughs) (laughs) Joke listeners, yeah. So the gurus that are setting themselves up on YouTube and TikTok and all over the social media now, they're not going through the rigorous process that many professionals in the financial industry have to do to justify their purchases and buying and selling decisions. What's something to watch out for and um, how can people think about these supposed gurus? So I think one way to look at gurus and uh, anyone that you use to influence your decision-making process is to consider their, their track record. So it's not just buy a particular investment. It's like, well, overall, how is their portfolio? Do they even have a portfolio? Do they show their holdings? Do they show what their investment mandate is? So, for example, some people might be high risk versus someone that's low risk. So how do you compare the pair, so to mm-hmm. speak? So that's why probably have a look at the institutional investors or the professional investors. So if you look at particularly active ETF providers, they've got all their holdings on their website. They have a process and they tell you exactly what they're doing, how they're investing and their reasons for investing as well. That's right. They're very transparent. They've got a monthly update where they talk about what they've done with the portfolio, what the outlook is, what are and what were the major drivers and contributors to the performance over the last month. So you've got a transparent record there. And obviously you can go through and see the investment processes as well. And that's a bare minimum amount of verification you should be using to look at investment recommendations or obviously the performance of that type of investment you're considering. So there's a difference there between gurus and professionals. And again, looking at track records and making sure the results are actually valid is important. Yep. For me as well, it's the idea that you've got to understand that there is a process. You don't get tickers served to you on a plate. A lot of people come in and they want they want to be told what to buy and sell. And that's no way of um, achieving commitment to a company or a portfolio that you're putting together. Yeah, that's right. And usually someone that's doing a recommendation has got a different incentivization, whereas a active manager or a professional manager, they are managing to a mandate and you need to consider if that investment will have a role in your portfolio. Okay, so we've heard about these biases. What are the shortcuts that we can take to become aware of them and be able to basically put these biases back in the place where they should be, which is not affecting our investing decisions? Yeah, and this is a, it's a great question. I struggled with myself for a long time and look, uh, I studied this for, <laughs> for a period of time. It's, it's very difficult to do, first of all. And if you commit to this uh, journey, there's no doubt you will be a better investor. And I think the key thing is if you can identify some of these biases, you won't feel as ruffled, definitely as much during uh, some of these panic moments or the moments of volatility that we've been going through. So it's definitely an exercise worth doing. Um, I guess one of them, and we just discussed it, was uh, really keeping a record of your investment decisions and particularly where you were really confident with a decision. How did that go? So track that. You know, that's probably the first key point. So where you were feeling overconfident, very high conviction call, how did that investment decision go? And also, what sources of information do you use? You must be consistent. So if you're looking at Australian shares or you're looking at global shares, what sources of information, who else were you listening to? Ensure that you are consistent because whenever you're buying or selling, it becomes a relative decision and you want to ensure that you use the same sources of information to come to that conclusion. Thirdly, obviously don't monitor results too frequently. 
whenever you, you purchase something, particularly if it's a risky investment, there will be volatility. Use that time, use that volatility to uh, ride out your decision, give it time. So that's also important. Again, don't be myopic, let your investment thesis mature. Another one, and it's probably a little bit more qualitative, is, is an investment out of character? So if you've historically been someone that's invested in listed investments and now you're considering something that's not as liquid, such as uh, venture capital or private equity, private debt, why are you going down that path? And what prism are you going to look through to evaluate this investment? So that's something you should look at, particularly, I think, with the new sorts of uh, investment offerings that are out there, new asset classes, be it cryptocurrency or uh, more sophisticated type investments. I also think you need to consider the multidimensional nature of risk. So it's not a particular risk to an investment, but what about things such as credit, particular relationships? So we know what's happening if you've invested um, with anything linked to Russia. Think about those things when you're investing in something peculiar or something that's higher risk. Is there one or two other qualitative risks that may affect that type of business that you can't see in the financial statements? So that's something probably you have to keep an eye on. And um, finally, think about your information sources. Is using the street research or using that traditional broker research you may be getting off your retail trading site giving you a competitive advantage? If you're looking at large cap stocks, it's probably difficult to get that competitive advantage by just using broker research. You need to consider They're, they're all doing it, aren't they? There, there's so That's many right. people researching. You, yeah. you, you probably need to do um, a bit more work around those aspects there. And I think finally, the other piece is just be careful with how you socialize your investment decision. So whether you're at a barbecue, whether you're at a pub or any sort of social settings, it's just human nature to hear the good stories, but it's that one bad story that uh, may give you um, second thoughts when you're looking at a particular decision. So, you know, always consider the uh, old anecdotes that are out there with a grain of salt, because uh, as we know, with human networks, we do like to show ourselves in uh, the best light. It sounds to me it's all about having a process, isn't it? That's right, Phil. And look at uh, eInvest. We've got uh, professional teams across Aussie equities and fixed income. And those specialists, yes, they invest according to their mandates, but they've got uh, deep teams, teams of professionals that only focus on investment decisions day in and day out. And they challenge each other. They challenge each other where they get information from, are they consistent with their calls and uh, how they measure up on a frequent uh, basis. And also importantly, in these sort of environments, where are the opportunities? So, you know, for a professional, it's just as important to look at your information sources, but you've got the extra layer of having transparency with your investors. And uh, that's why it's uh, fantastic at uh, eInvest. We've got some great teams that uh, look right under the hood for opportunities, whether it's in Australia or in fixed income globally as well. And um, they've been quite uh, robust in these times of volatility. If people want to find out more information, they can go to the website, which is einvest.com.au forward slash BF for behavioural finance, of course. And you can ask questions, get some more information and links to Zaf's articles about this as well. Zaf Subida, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks, Phil. It's great to be here. If you found this podcast helpful, please tell a friend, especially if it's someone who needs to start thinking about investing for their future. You'll be helping them and helping me to keep this show on the road. Shares for Beginners is for information and educational purposes only. It isn't financial advice and you shouldn't buy or sell any investments based on what you've heard here. Any opinion or commentary is the view of the speaker only, not Shares for Beginners. This podcast doesn't replace professional advice regarding your personal financial needs, circumstances or current situation. And thank you for listening to my podcast.